begin. Uh, Mark, would you start the recording? I do, thank you. You're very welcome. So welcome to everyone on, on behalf of CDS Consulting Co-op, Cooperative Development Services, and Food Co-op 500. We're very pleased to have you here today. We have over 60 people who've registered for the seminar um, from about 40 different groups all over the country, and we're very glad that you're here. Uh, today's webinar will be presented by Bill Gessner on creating a development budget, sources, and uses. Um, before we get started with that webinar, I want to just remind you that we have two more webinars in the fall series, and then we'll take a little break and pick back up again in, in January for four sessions uh, next week. Uh, one week from today, uh, Wednesday, October uh, 22nd, we'll have Mel Braverman presenting on evaluating uh, feasibility and planning for success. So if you haven't registered for that, uh, we hope you will. And two weeks from today will be Debbie Swasuna uh, discussing the um, uh, work that she does with uh, market analysis, market research, projecting sales potential, and identifying site characteristics. Um, so next, I'd like to introduce uh, Stuart Reed, who is uh, helping us uh, coordinate this webinar series. Uh, Stuart is with Food Pot 500 to just say a, a brief introduction about Food Pot 500. Stuart? Thanks, Marilyn. Looking at the list of attendees, I, I'm guessing that most of you know who I am and, and what we do, but we are out there to provide the resources, support, referrals, and advice that can help your organizing team more effectively and efficiently start a new food co-op. And um, in addition to hoping to be able to provide you with those tools, we are also always looking for ideas from you on how we can provide more of what you need. So don't hesitate to contact me after this webinar or any other time. Thanks, Stuart. Um, Mark is going to be uh, facilitating the technical part of the webinar, and he'll just give you a few highlights on how you can participate using this tool. Mark? Thanks, Marilyn. Um, yeah, we'll be using the GoToWebinar um, written interface for uh, interacting, and we do hope to hear your questions and comments today. Um, you may need to expand that part of the toolbar hit the little uh, triangle next to the letter Q and the word question, and then type in the box there, submit a question for staff and submit. And Stuart is going to be managing the question comment queue. So feel free to practice now and exercise your fingers, and we look forward to hearing from you during the session. At the end of the session there, well, actually, I'm not sure which way it's set up today, sorry. There either will be an evaluation coming on your screen when the webinar is over, or you'll get an email with a link to the evaluation for the session in about an hour after it's over. Whichever way, we really look forward to your, your comments uh, in the evaluation. Thanks, Marilyn. Thank you, Mark. And um, I forgot to tell you that my name is Marilyn Scholl, and I'm the manager of the CDS Consulting Co-op, and we are very uh, pleased to to work with Food Co-op 500 to bring me this series. Uh, Bill Gessner is presenting today's workshop. Uh, Bill is one of our consultants specializing in uh, expansion and growth of cooperatives and has done uh, uh, a lot of work with, with co-ops of all sizes and all stages of their development and helping them look out at their future and how they're going to design um, development budgets to, um, to plan and account for the work that they do. And so we're, we're very pleased to have Bill today to bring you his wealth of experience. So Bill, you want to take it away? Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, good day, everybody, far and wide, gather yeah, wherever you are today to, uh, to come together to see what we can learn about uh, developing food co-ops. The um, focus of our, uh, of our session today is um, we have some learning goals that we're looking for to come out of this webinar. Uh, primary focus is on uh, learning, becoming familiar with the process and format for creating initial drafts of the sources and uses development budget, and, uh, and also to learn how that budget can be integrated uh, with the development models of Food Co-op 500, the four stages 
four cornerstones in three stages. Uh, you can learn more about that uh, development model uh, if you haven't been exposed to it before at the Food Club 500 website. And uh, we'll have a little refresher, of course, on the model here today. Uh, and then thirdly, you know, how CDS Consulting Club can help you in the creation and modification of the sources and uses budget. And um, we also want to talk about and get a, gain an understanding of the relationship between the sources and uses budget and the financial performance. Uh, the, the financial performance is the primary tool for determining financial feasibility. I often think of the sources and uses budget as the cover page for the financial performance. We will explain in greater detail the difference between the two documents. And we'll lastly gaining an understanding of some of the key decision points that your organizing group and your board of directors will face in terms of when to utilize member equity and member loans uh, in the development process as you're, as you're assessing the risk level uh, for your co-op. So those are the, are the goals uh, for this webinar. And uh, the agenda that we're looking at today for our hour and a half session is to spend a little bit of time, the first half hour approximately, uh, on going over the sources and uses budget and giving you getting grounded in that. We'll have some time for questions. Uh, and also joining us today, uh, we have as one of the uh, panelists here is Ben Sandell from the Friendly City Food Co-op in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Uh, ben has participated in a few of the other webinars and is offering some of uh, what his group is going through and how they're, for example, using sources and uses development budget to help uh, manage their project and also it also functions as a communication tool. Uh, so anyway, the first half hour will be gaining uh, some understanding of the, of the budget itself, sources and uses development budget. And then we'll then we'll break it down by stages and look at the budget for stage one, the budget for stage two, the budget for stage three, including specifically all the sub-stages. Uh, and then we will have time at the end for opening up the questions and then a little time at the very end to wrap up and conclude. So that's our agenda for the day. Uh, the four cornerstones, the three stages model, which I assume many of you are familiar with and gaining greater familiarity with, shows the, the four cornerstones as kind of the primary ingredients for the development of a food co-op. And we have the vision, the talent, capital, and system uh, being four components of informing the cornerstones. And then as you move through the model from the organizing stage, which is stage one, feasibility and planning stage, stage two, and then the implementation stage three. And further information on this model can be found at this um, link here, as well as at the Food Club 500 website. Uh, the three stages, uh, you've seen the slide before if you've been with us, but showing the, the basic stages and sub-stages in the development model. And the important thing here, again, is to understand the function of the dotted line as a key decision point, uh, that at the end of stage 2B, you would be securing a site with contingencies. And then during stage 3A, you would finish all of your design work and get, finish collecting and getting commitments on all of your financing, getting all of your financing in place. And basically at the end of stage 3A, removing the contingencies and going 
past the key decision point, the no turning back point. Once you go past the solid line, there's no turning back. Um, you remove the contingencies from your lease and you go into the construction phase. So it's important to keep that in mind, this timeline in mind, as we discuss the sources and use the budget. Um, approximate time range for each of the three stages. Uh, all together, the, the going through all the three stages and sub-stages takes. Moving aggressively through it would be taking a year and a half to three years plus. No, I'm going to comment, come in that uh, you're a little hard to hear if you could speak up just a bit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the time range here, again, showing that the you moved aggressively through these three stages, uh, that it's, it's still going to take a year and a half to three years, and we're seeing that the number of groups are taking longer to work their way through the different stages. Uh, to gain some perspective on that. Uh, we have a slide here that shows the key decision points so that at the end of stage one, uh, when your organization is informed, you've incorporated, uh, you've made an, uh, an initial assessment or a preliminary assessment of feasibility, and you have X number of members, say 300 members, then you're ready to move on to stage two. And that's a, a decision point. So we've covered this in, in past uh, webinars, and I'm not going to go into detail with it, but we've included the slides here. The sources and uses development budget, uh, again, provides a clear one-page financial picture of the startup of the food plot, lists all the key assumptions, lists out the uses of the funds that are needed to get the store open, and then where are those funds that come from, the sources, and then the simplicity and kind of the beauty of a sources and uses development budget is that the sources equals the uses. Not a very complicated formula. And you can begin doing a sources and uses budget at the very early stage of your project based on the limited information you know today, and then there will be many drafts of the budget going forward. Uh, as I said earlier, it is a key management and communication tool uh, for the leadership group of your co-op. Uh, the intent is to be conservative in your projections and estimate costs so that there won't be unpleasant surprises as you as you go forward into the project. You will welcome the pleasant surprises. One of the things to keep in mind is that when you create your budget and you list out your use of funds, that does not necessarily mean you have a, an, what you might think of as an allowance to say, okay, oh boy, we get to go out and spend $500,000 on equipment. Let's see how fast we can do that. Uh, you still need to practice cost containment uh, and have certain discipline uh, so that you develop the ability to spend money in a wise way. You, know, you will need to spend money to spend to achieve your goal. Overall, this whole process of creating a source of use of budget is a stretching process. Um, you will, it is an exercise, and so limber up. Uh, we have a, a sample of the source of use of budget but I want you to keep in mind that actual experiences will vary widely. Uh, the sample that we're going to look at uh, represents a typical range. And uh, the, we can take a look at that sample here now. And so you can See, we have a section here called Key Assumptions, and then we have a section called Uses of Funds, and then below that, Sources. Um, notes up at the top here, this is an initial working draft. Um, 
this scenario will need to be tested with the financial performer to determine if this scenario is financially feasible. The financial performer projects the, the performance of the co-op in years one through ten to determine if there's adequate cash flow and if the debt can be serviced. So the financial performer will create <coughs> projected income statement, and cash flow, and balance sheet, and debt service schedule see if this scenario that we're sketching out in the sources and use of the budget is financially feasible. Uh, all costs are ballpark estimates based on knowledge of prior projects and market rates. Costs will definitely increase over time as we're seeing. So the uh, key assumptions here, we're looking at a retail food co-op that is looking at uh, leasing rather than purchasing and having a total square footage of 6,000 square feet, uh, retail space two-thirds of that at 4,000, typical range of retail of 65 to 70 percent of the total space. Projected sales are shown at $600 per retail square foot, but that would need to be uh, tested and verified through a market analysis. Uh, not necessarily necessary to have the market analysis prior to doing a financial performa, but at some point in the development process, the market analysis would would verify the assumption. Um, I've in the past have said, you know, four hundred dollars per retail is a lower threshold for what you would expect uh, sales per square foot, sales per retail square foot. I've increased that in this version here today up to $600 per retail square foot. I don't know if there will be some markets that will not come in at that with the market analysis. It would come in and say your opening sales are $400 or $430 or something like that per retail square foot. Uh, that will make it more difficult to be financially feasible. Uh, we're certainly seeing the challenges of making these new food co-op projects be financially feasible. Uh, then we show an assumption related to lease rate and additional expenses related to the lease, sometimes referred to as triple net expenses, triple meaning real estate, insurance, common area maintenance. And then the uh, off-street parking, there's not supposed to be a dollar sign there, but I, can't, <laughs> I haven't been able to get rid of that. But 24 spaces, uh, six per thousand square feet of retail would be a, a minimal level of parking. Uh, the projected date of possession is April 2010, open for business August 2010. The use of the funds are listed here, and then below that we have the source of the funds. Uh, before I get to walk through that, I want to call on Ben a little bit to join the, the conversation and maybe to comment a little bit about what it was like for the co-op in Harrisonburg, Virginia, Friendly City Food Co-op, to begin working through a sources and uses budget from the very first draft to how many drafts have you done so far, Ben? Uh, uh, a lot. Yeah, and uh, maybe you could just describe a little bit what it, you know, what was the uh, tone and tenor of your <laughs> of your experience through that, uh, and what did you gain from it? Okay. Uh, well, certainly the first round, uh, which we did with Bill, uh, was a huge stretching exercise because it was a lot more money than we could have conceived of at that point. Um, but once we broke it down and as a group spent some time looking at what the money was for uh, and how it was expected to be raised, it, you know, we kind of grew into a comfort level of it. Uh, and of course it's increased steadily since that first one. Um, then we've adjusted some of the assumptions that we started off with as we get more uh, real numbers that we can plug in. Um, but it was a, a really good 
way to kind of frame the scope of the project, uh, help to talk about it to other people better and more accurately. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been a, a pretty handy tool all the way around. Yeah, you know, and it sharpens focus, and it you know certainly can give gives you a picture all of a sudden of oh here's what we're talking about. And uh, again, the idea is that this is a draft, and you know initially we start out with uh, projecting some numbers, you know, based on what we know of your specific situation that you're looking at but also combined with what we're seeing with other projects, both for startups and existing food co-ops that are expanding into new stores, uh, what we're seeing around the country uh, with that. The, um, let's start taking a little look here at uh, the Forma here. We see the two major items of expense in any project would be, this is, a, again, a lease situation where there would be some what are called leasehold improvements or renovations to the space that you're leasing. Um, the costs of this are dramatically going up in recent years. Um, you know, in this scenario, we're assuming they would be $70 per square foot, uh, $70 times 6,000 square feet that you um, that you would be leasing. The typical range. Is 65 to 80 dollars per square foot, so we could just as use, easily be using the 80 dollars per square foot number, but we're we're not we're not we're even a little less than half. We're in the lower half of that range here at 70. And uh, similarly with equipment, uh, 65 dollars per square foot, typical range being 60 to 80 dollars a square foot, it can be higher or lower. Equipment, uh, I would say that this is assumed a combination of new equipment and reconditioned equipment. Uh, you could perhaps outfit a store simply by getting used equipment, buying it at an auction, uh, transporting it, storing it, uh, getting it in working order, uh, and you might save a little bit on that, but there's a lot of time and trouble and uncertainty and risk involved in that route. So. When I say the equipment is a combination of new and reconditioned equipment, I mean that you're working with a specifically refrigeration equipment. You're working with a reliable um, refrigeration contractor who deals with and reconditions or remanufactures used equipment and is willing to put a warranty on it. Uh, with these two areas, the leasehold improvements and the equipment line, represent the largest parts of the project. The leasehold improvement line is the area, one of the two areas most often underestimated. Uh, so watch out for that always because I work with groups and they do some of their initial quotes and estimates and the contractor will say, well, we think that we can do this for X number of dollars and by the time you get done with all the design process, it's three times that and so, um, so that's an area to watch for. Uh, the inventory is the next item here, projected at $40 per retail square foot compared to the others which are listed as based on total square feet. And again, a typical range, and here somewhere in the middle. Uh, then we have a line for fees, which includes all the things that are listed here. Consultants, architects, store design, legal financing. Initially, I'll estimate fees at 12% of the items listed above, and then add a little bit to provide an additional allowance for project management. Perhaps some, there's already some allowance in the 12% number, but if you're wanting to be able to have the resources to invest in qualified professional project management, it is good to build that into your budget. And so that's what this example illustrates. Uh, you would then create a what I would call a supporting schedule that would begin to show how this $146,000 is broken down. Um, then we 
have a line for opening, operating and admin prior to opening. Uh, let's say their basic expenses incurred in the years as you're organizing. We want to list that. Uh, then we have some soft costs. I'm not going to get into too great of detail in, in this explanation. Uh, but startup promotion, startup staffing, holding and site costs, which include things like a lease deposit or rent that you would be paying before opening, any interest that you'd be paying on your debt before opening, and then suggesting to put in an allowance of some kind for what we're calling post-opening professional support. Uh, in many cases, uh, costs that are going through a, a major project, even existing costs and startup costs, they use professional support during the project itself, but once they get open, they either don't feel they have enough money or enough time to utilize professional support in that critical first year or the first two years or first three years. And so having some allowance for that, some kind of set aside for that is the intent behind this line. Then we have a working capital allowance, which is designed to provide adequate cash to cover initial operating losses. We had been initially projecting this at 4% of year one sales, and then we look at what the actual performa and the actual cash flows um, project out, and then we adjust that. So now, more recently, we've been using 6% or 8% of year one sales as an, as an initial estimate of working capital. And then we have the subtotal of the uses, and we provide an overrun allowance that is initially calculated at 50%. Uh, once all the costs have been firmly quoted, or you can support, or you can, you can say that you've done your research on this and made adjustments, then you can not eliminate that overrun allowance, but lower it from 15% to 10%. And then we have a total project cost, in this case, of $1,650,000. Uh, and that averages $276 per square foot. Typically, we're seeing project costs for an existing co-op to relocate or to expand through relocation is around 225 to 250 per square foot, and that's increasing. But the difference between an existing co-op and a startup is that an existing co-op will bring some of its inventory, some of its uh, small part of its equipment with it, and has capacity and skills so that it doesn't have as many soft costs in some of these areas. So in, in, in theory, you can understand why a startup would even cost more than what an existing co-op does. So at this point, I'm going to pause for any questions. If Stuart has any questions from the attendees, and then we'll check in with Ben to see if he has any observations too. Sure. <clears throat> we have several questions, Bill. Um, the first, uh, I think, is the uh, question about how does one figure out what your initial sales projection could be? Well, initially, you, you 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 just kind of grab onto a number. <laughs> is about the best I can say. Uh, I mean, you you can, you know, to be safe, you know, I would, a, a very conservative number would be four hundred dollars per retail square foot. Uh, a little less safe would be the six hundred dollars, and and you can just kind of plug that number in. It's it's not that essential of a number for the sources and uses budget itself only used to calculate, for example, the startup promotion budget and the startup staffing budget and the working capital allowance. And, so, and all those things, of course, can be changed, uh, you know, as as you gain more information. So it's, it's not a big deal to for the sources and uses budget. For the performer itself, we will, you know, kind of talk through uh, your market and and the competition and, you know, try to make a, a reasonable guess based on, you know, previous other co-ops that we're aware of, but 
that that guess that we make is that in no me no way takes the place of a professional market analysis. Okay. Uh, a question that maybe Ben can also address: What was made a, What was the makeup of the group that looked over your um, study? Was it a board, or was it more the, more people involved than that? I, I'm uh, assuming that they're referring to the, your your sources and uses research. I'll assume that also. Um, we have a probably a not uh, ideal or, or not typical structure, but we do have a board, and we also have had uh, a founding team that transitioned to just committee volunteers, um, and we pretty much worked on it together, uh, reviewed it together, with the understanding that when it came down to uh, the important decisions, especially that uh, decisions involving uh, any kind of contracts or major expenditures, that it was ultimately the board that had to make those decisions. But given that we had a number of people who had been working on the project since the beginning who were not on the board, we didn't want to lose their input. So we kind of did straw polling uh, for some of these where we'd get the temperature of everyone in the group and then the board would consider it potentially do additional discussion and then go from there. Luckily, we've not had any major areas where the larger group was in conflict with the board in terms of a decision that had to be made. Uh, but we would look at these, I mean, and, and, and actually to be also uh, fair to the process, once the larger group looked at this and then the pro forma later, they pretty much said, we'd like the board and the, and the finance team to just take care of this. You know, it's a lot to understand. So we continually, the board and the finance team have continually gone back to the larger group to say, here's what changes have been made, here's what it looks like today. But they... Uh, there was a substantial learning curve, and they felt comfortable leaving it to the board and the finance and the treasurer to, to kind of keep making the changes and keep making the adjustments as new information came in and just reporting back. Good. All right. Uh, yes. Really, got quite a few questions coming in on this. Uh, a lot of people have an interest. Um, yeah. One of the next ones I'd like to give you, I'm confused about leasehold improvements. Uh, I hear Bill cautioning that it can go over $70 a square foot, but that sounds way too low. Does that assume nothing is being done to change the structure of the building? If you're looking at a building that's really old and needs structural work, including plumbing, electrical, HVAC, what happens then? Well, um, yes, the, the the costs can range above the $80 per square foot, but you also look at what what would new construction costs and have to do some kind of comparison there. If you you know new construction is typically costing in the area of let's say $140 to $150 per square foot for a you know a building plus all the build out, so you get it to the point where you're ready to put in equipment and inventory. And so if your leasehold improvements are getting up to $100 and 120 or whatever, uh, you know, that's a that's a major, major investment. Uh, so the, this typical range, uh, 65 to 80, is much more than cosmetic improvements. It does include uh, work to the, you know, some potential structural reinforcing if need be. Uh, it, it includes getting the HVAC system up to where it needs to be in the utilities, uh, plumbing and lighting and floors, walls, and ceilings, and et cetera. So there's major work involved there, but uh, I get very concerned if I see that number go above this typical higher range in terms of its ability for the project to be financially feasible. And also, when you leasehold, even leasehold improvements at the level that are shown here makes it much more difficult to finance a project because those leasehold improvements don't serve as, as, as collateral of any value to a lender. And so that, that needs to be kept in mind. And I, I would add that using uh, these guidelines, or at least being aware of these guidelines, we've found that it is a uh, it, it makes us more disciplined 
in the decision making relating to these different aspects, so specifically the leasehold improvements, we eliminated some potential locations because they were simply going to be too expensive to uh, build out, and the landlord was not able or interested in giving us a large enough allowance to bring it down to what we would consider a feasible level. I think we've also probably made our merchandising sort of concept, uh, not so much merchandising, but just the whole interior and exterior uh, appearance of the store, maybe a slightly more modest uh, vision for it in order to make sure that we are able to stay within the improvement cost that we've, uh, you know, that we've decided we really need to keep it as a cap there. Um, so, you know, to some degree, you use these numbers to drive decisions that have to be made. And, and I would add that, that uh, for example, even here, showing $70 a square foot, and then if you work through the financial performa, then you might find in the specific situation you're looking at, once all the, the numbers are looking at, that you really can't afford anything more than $40 per square foot. And so that will, you know, give you additional information that you need both through your site selection and lease negotiation. And uh, so, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of dynamic involved in this whole this whole area. We we are definitely using that now as part of our uh, lease negotiation with the landlord. That we were pretty open with him about what we what the cost needed to be for us and what that meant in terms of what we could pay him. And uh, you know, it's been. It's been favorable. I mean, not every landlord would want to share that much info, but in this case, it seems to have been the right thing to do. That leads nicely to the next question. Um, what about the confidential nature of these materials? How, who should you share it with and under what circumstances? We're, we're bad about confidentiality, so Bill, you take this. <laughs> um, you know, it's a... It's something that needs to be looked at in each instance, but I would say the leadership group of the co-op needs to keep certain information confidential, and specifically that information related to specific real estate uh, sites, and yet if you, even if you let this information out, it shows that you're looking at paying grants in the area of $12 a square foot. Uh, and this was just a very preliminary draft, and that information got circulated widely in the community, and there were, you know, it was, got into the rumor mill or whatever. That's that's not good for your negotiating position. Uh, but there is some information that you can take from a source of the use of budget and begin to educate your 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 core group and even some of your members. Uh, because eventually you're going to need to get your members on board with the nature of this project, specifically with the member loans. But you can group some of these numbers together, and you don't need to show the level of detail that is being shown here, for example. Uh, one good point to keep in mind is the overrun allowance is that you don't want to be, as you're beginning to work with contractors and they say, well, what can you afford? You don't want to let them know that you will have that you have an overrun allowance in your in your budget because one way or the other they'll gobble that up very quickly. Um, no ill intent on their part, but that's just the way it goes. So thinking through this carefully about what information is distributed and how widely distributed it goes beyond the the board um, requires some careful consideration. The only parts that we actually uh, shared outside of our board and our, our uh, founding team group is uh, the, the total, the total project cost, and then when you get down into the sources, we've also talked a little bit about the three different kind of major groups where the sources are going to come from, and it's been like a stretching exercise for the membership that when we've uh, we don't distribute this. We talk about more at member meetings, but to give them a better idea of what we're going to be looking uh, to to them for, and uh, how much this project will cost, and what the kind of the scope and quality level we're shooting for. But we don't let the individual line items that that we don't show anyone publicly. Yeah. 
so we should we should probably move along into the sources uh, here. Um, and as Ben mentioned, there are I'd like to say that there are three categories of sources, and let's take a look at those three broad first. Um, you know, here we see, oh my goodness, we have a project that's going to be 1.65 million. Where are we going to find that money? Ooh dear. Uh, it, it is it is a challenge, but it gets easier when you break it down. And so the three groupings that we look at would be first what I would call the owner's contribution, uh, and then at the bottom here we have the bank debt, and in between these two we have what is called the kind of the gap, you know, between the owner's contribution and the bank debt, which I'm referring to as exter external bonds that are subordinated. Subordinated means they are subordinate to the primary bank debt in the event of a worst case scenario, the risk exposure is the least for the bank and the risk exposure increases as you go back up the sources to the owner's contribution. So the sources are kind of listed in order of declining risk here. Not 100%, but the overall, that's the case. And so we have these three categories, and we'll look at the owner's contribution in more detail, but it's important to think of the percentage of each of these categories of total. Um, starting with the bank debt, the bank debt might be between 25 and 45% of the total. Uh, aim for 25% or as close as you can get to that or even lower would be my recommendation. Uh, specifically, given the economic conditions we're currently facing, it's become more difficult for, I think, for a startup food co-op to obtain bank financing. So earlier drafts of this uh, worksheet probably had a higher percentage of the, of the bank debt you know, and I, I know of a few, or, you know, a couple of startups, I guess, that have happened over the last five years where the bank debt portion has ranged from 50 to 63 percent of the total. But I think those days are over, at least for the time being. Uh, and so, for example, working with uh, Friendly City Food Club, we're now having to rework their performa and lower the percentage of the bank debt, which I think was around 50%, and you know, working finding ways to get it closer to 25%. So, so we have the owner's contribution uh, should be as close to 50% of the project as possible, at least 33%. Uh, this example shows it at 48%, and so then this the gap then. Between 40, you know, 48 percent for owner's contribution, 32 percent for the bank debt, leaves a little less than 20 percent needing to come from other sources, other external subordinated sources. So let's look here at the owner's contribution and the things that make that up. Let's say cash that you are able to raise from benefits and donations. Uh, these would be assumed to be the net proceeds from those activities unless the expenses are shown in the uses budget when we had that uh, under operating or admin prior to opening or startup promotion, maybe those expenses are shown in there. But if not, then we need to just it's easy to be the net proceeds. Uh, any grants that you are able to find and you know, there's no easy answer on, on that, but some groups have been successful with that. Uh, member equity, uh, this situation assumes $150 as a uh, member share requirement per member at 1,000 members prior to opening. This needs to be thought through for each specific situation and a goal set. Um, member share might 
be even higher than 150, uh, or it might be in the form of ongoing requirement of $30 a year, or $40 a year without a without a cap. Uh, so those are some of the different models for that. Uh, member equity would need to be raised fully within two to three months of opening. Here's some end of stage one, so many members, end of stage 2A, 2B, et cetera, showing different levels of members working up to 1,000. I'm seeing some of the groups that are setting their goal at you know, 1,500 or 2,000 members prior to opening, and I applaud them for that. Um, overall, a, a re, a retail food club of 4,000 square feet has potential to have as many as 25 to 3,000 members by by maturity point of let's say year five. So the largest piece of the owner's contribution would come from member loans. Uh, this scenario assumes 120 loans and an average of $5,000. We will we will be doing a uh, webinar on uh, member loans. I believe it's in January. We'll go into that in much more detail. Uh, but it's appropriate to seek legal and consulting advice. I've worked with many groups in designing and you know, supporting member loan programs. Um, that's a very important piece of what needs to be raised. This number has been increased from an earlier version of this worksheet from 400,000 to 600,000, partly to allow for the lowering of the bank debt. So, Moving on then to the middle category, the gap category, we see a contribution coming from the landlord, and this essentially serves as an offset to what is being invested for the leasehold improvements. So the net that the co-op would pay for the leasehold improvements would be 420,000 minus 105,000. Then we some small amounts are showing some vendor participation and free fill for manufacturers. The, the co-op as a startup organization won't have much leverage to get vendor credit or free fill. We are looking at if there are any sources of low interest long term loans through through a city or a community. This scenario assumes a three percent loan for say fifteen years. It would be subordinate to the primary bank debt and help leverage the primary bank debt. As given the economic conditions we're in, this type of these types of programs will become increasingly more important and I think they they will come forth uh, perhaps more than they are right now as a way to stimulate you know, business development. So that's a run through of the different sources that would bring us to the total uses. And uh, also, we show a little collateral here. Uh, how might collateral value for a bank loan be calculated? I'm not going to spend any time on this right now, but you can look at a particular formula there. But at this stage, given the economy, all of these assumptions are up in the air. Uh, but I would, I would suggest that co-ops continue with their planning work uh, and their effort to raise capital, even in the current economic climate, uh, regardless of the of whether it's a strong or weak market, it's, it takes time to raise capital, and you should continue your planning and your work for that. And you might shift your strategy somewhat, but I would say keep keep your nose to the grindstone. Is that, is that the right thing? Anyway. Uh, um, that's a look at the sources and use of budget. Uh, I want to take a, perhaps a couple questions and a comment from Ben once we've talked about the sources. And then I want to go into this worksheet, which breaks down the use of budget and the sources budget into each of the stages in the three stage development model. And so, the first, let's go back and if we have questions on the sources. We, we certainly have some questions here for you. 
although I must say that that grindstone on the nose thing sounds awfully painful, Bill. Uh, one question here, I'm going to rephrase it a little bit. I, I think it has, covers an awful lot of ground. Um, this template, your assumptions are based around uh, opening a store of a moderately large size. I mean, we wouldn't call this a big co-op by some standards, but it, for a startup group, this can look like a pretty big store. And is it scalable to any size? And also related to that, is there good uh, information that we can share about uh, relative success of small stores starting out on a shoestring versus just stores that are this size and larger? It's a lot to tackle, I realize. Yeah, well, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, we've those of us working to try to help assemble resources for the sort of co-op, sort of food co-ops, have had a lot of discussions on what the appropriate store size and, you know, for us to recommend uh, to a community. And certainly part of it depends on the market and and can be that information can be gained during a, through a market analysis. But more often than not, it's been our observation that groups that have come together have had a vision for a food co-op and they've envisioned it providing a set of services in a space that is probably too small to provide those services. So if their vision really is to do X, Y, Z plus A, B, C, and if they, they probably need a larger space. And as we look at the evolution of the natural food market, we're seeing that Whereas five or ten years ago, small stores certainly had a valuable uh, market niche, you know, a viable market niche. That it, as time goes along, you know, moving towards a larger store, and that's not to be confused with uh, Walmart or the big box retailers or the, the conventional grocery industry. They would consider any store under twenty thousand feet to be too small. Uh, I think uh, for an existing food co-op, I would look at a store size of 8,000 retail to 12,000 total. That's perhaps ideal concept-wise today. Some people would disagree with me, but that's kind of my assessment. And then for a startup group, I kind of see the, you know, half of that basically being within within the range and still being sized enough to be able to compete effectively and service your members. Now, there are exceptions to that, and it can certainly vary between urban and rural and, and et cetera. So uh, as you're looking at trying to source some use of budget, to some extent, if this is scalable based on size, uh, theoretically, you would think the larger you get, the cost per square foot might go down a little bit, but it's not always the case. Uh, and vice versa, the smaller you get, the cost per square foot might go up, but that can be the case. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I think I tried to answer most of what you covered there, Stuart. Yeah, that, that I think as much as we can hope for, <laughs> since we don't actually have all the answers to those questions, in my opinion. Um, here's a really, uh, let's go to the other extreme. This one should be fairly easy. Do, do these figures in your um, uses budget include outside improvements, including parking lots, loading docks, and that sort of thing? Good question. Um, if there were extensive exterior outside improvements or facade improvements, uh, they would need to be added in here. Uh, in a leasing situation, it is kind of assumed that much of the exterior site is in workable condition, although that's not always the case. Uh, or you may be able to negotiate for your landlord to put that in workable condition in addition to whatever land landlord contribution or tenant improvement allowance they would offer you. Bill, can you comment on grants? Uh, you've got, uh, in this particular scenario, $35,000, which seems high. Uh, how, where would that kind of money come from? I, I can actually 
can give you some answers on that. Um, and we found that at least with that, you know, those grants have been easier to get than we expected. Um, and uh, one of our sources is, which I think are almost all over the place, are uh, the RCMD groups, the Research Conservation and Development groups, which are funded through the Farm Bill. They're, uh, it, it's worth looking them up on the web, seeing if there's one nearby and talking to them. I know that Denise out in Iowa also got a lot of help from their RCMD. Um, and their grants are decent size. Uh, Howard Bowers Fund, of course. Um, we got a grant from there. We got a grant from CBS. Uh, not a large one, but we appreciate it very much. And they all add up. Um, we also got a grant from, well, with the exception of RCMD, everything else has come from having a, basically anytime Food Club 500 or Stewart emails us because there's a grant opportunity, we go for it immediately, and we've gotten almost every single one we've applied for, um, and now we're continuing to look for some larger grants, more locally, like within our state. Um, but the, the grants are actually, you know, not as hard as we would have thought to get. I have an interesting comment from uh, one of the other program participants that if you were awarded a seed fund grant and a sprout loan, you'd have $35,000 right there, although the loan is not a grant. It does have to be repaid. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, I, I think Ben's answer is very good, and their experience is, is a good one to look at, but you it's also you can't get too, you can't put all your focus and all your, you can't get too attached to, to getting grants and as a condition of moving forward. Well, it's a really tiny percentage of your overall budget, really small. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very small, and if you aren't able to raise the grant, look to other sources of, of capital, including, you know, from your members or member equity or member loans or, you know, uh, other low-interest long-term loans or bank loans. Uh, don't, don't get stalled or don't get stuck in the, in the search for grants, but, you know, devote some energy to it and be persistent. Okay, I've got two acronym questions. We've got to watch out for those acronyms. RCSB and RCMB. What are they? Where are they from? Is that what Ben was reading? Oh, well, what do those acronyms mean? Oh, it's uh, uh, Resource Conservation and Development, R C and D, like the letters R C, ampersand D. Uh, that's a, they're um, a local, they're local groups that have federal backing that uh, work to maintain agricultural heritage around the country. So if you have any agricultural uh, activities around you, they want to keep it viable, keep it, you know, uh, uh, um, a viable option for the next generation and beyond to continue to farm rather than those farms that turn into suburbia as they so often do. So that's what the R, C, and D are. Um, and I can email that to, I guess, you guys, they're not, and you guys can distribute it back out to Bill and do it. Um, somebody else just gave us a link uh, as a response, and I just forwarded it so it should be visible to all of you. Yes, that looks right. Um, okay, we, questions are coming in kind of fast and furious here, but uh, this one backs up just a little bit, but I think it's important. The, uh, the sources and uses budget, should that be uh, developed by somebody on the board or steering committee, uh, or would it be better to use an accountant or perhaps a different option? Well, um, I mean, anybody can take a stab at it. Uh, I think that, you know, the work that that we do and that I do in working with a lot of startup food co-ops is we'll sometimes take a, you know, it's, it's probably an hour and a half on the phone to kind of walk through and develop a budget like this. And we do it fairly quickly and we make, you know, some quick sets of assumptions and at least it's a starting point. And I would recommend that rather than trying to struggle over finding out what these numbers are because you, you, you probably don't have the base of experience to to get very reliable numbers to begin with, uh, but then once the format is set up, 
then you can go to work to try to create, let's say, supporting schedules for, uh, you know, how, you know, the fee by fee line, for example. The, as you go through a design process, you begin to be able to assemble an equipment list and you get preliminary bids from the contractors. Uh, and so I would, I would go that route rather than trying to wait till you get all that information in detailed form uh, and add up every piece of equipment and say, oh, we think it's going to cost $61,422 for our equipment and, and then later find out that it's going to be you know, $390,000. Uh, so typically an accountant wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have industry-specific knowledge to assist with this. And so I would say, you know, work off this template and then um, contact us for you know, professional support. And I think the, the hour and a half version of working through this would, would be well worth your time and investment for. And I concur. <laughs> One of the uh, questions I have here is about whether most of these grants that have been mentioned or grant opportunities are primarily are available to rural communities. Is that true? And are there other options for urban communities? I think there are options for urban communities. And uh, I've never tried to become an expert on it, but I've certainly seen other, other co-ops identify in urban areas, identify sources for grants. And uh, you know we might uh, we might find something uh, you know that we could. I mean, some of the other people on the webinar might be able to provide some information on that. But I don't have a I don't have a listing of, of grants. So, so um, Stuart, do you want to ask Ben a question here? Well, I have to just. I have to do a step away for just a half a second here. Oh, no problem. Um, let me see one good one for you. Uh, ben, have you started working with lenders on loans yet? Um, we have started talking to banks. Yeah. That's what I mean. Um, yeah. We have not, not yet fully ruled out our member loan drive. We're hopefully really close, but we're still uh, working away on it. And it, it's not a great time at the moment to be going to banks for this. Um, so that's we're looking at it as every time we talk to a bank, it gives us more information, more knowledge. We get better at answering the questions they ask. Uh, and we're creating relationships that when things do, you know, when there is money available to borrow uh, or they're more in a borrowing mood, we hope that at that point we'll have the relationships in place so we'll be able to move forward then. But at the moment, things are kind of stuck in a little bit of a folding pattern as far as bank debt goes. Have you had uh, the opportunity to talk to different kinds of local lenders, like credit unions, banks, local banks, national banks? Any? We've, we've talked some to National Cooperative Bank um, and also to uh, the local credit union that currently holds our, our bank accounts and uh, to some other local banks also, or local slash regional banks. Um, and we're... Uh, People really like the idea, and they are uh, pretty positive about the quality of our materials. You know, the, the things like the sources and uses in the pro forma, and you know, the, the level of effort we put into it, and uh, that's all been a positive. But we've not yet had anybody say, "And I'm really interested in making this loan for you." Yet, um, we're also considering what Bill calls, I think, a pro rata participation loan, where we're Rather than get all of the bank financing from one organization, they'll probably come from two, which means that they'll both be in the first position and there'll be a lot of paperwork associated with it. But the advantage is it reduces their exposure, each one, by half. So it makes it a little potentially more an easier loan to sell, I guess, uh, or for them to, for us to sell them on the concept of. Uh, but we haven't gotten very far with that conversation. Okay. This might be a, a trend that comes back into play. It, it, it was something that was done more often uh, five or ten years ago, and now it may be coming back into play over the next few years. We'll see. 
our, our credit union was a lot more interested. As a as a single loan, it would be very very large for them to even consider. But with in half, it was much more in their you know realm of possibility, and they certainly support our concept and, and believe that we're uh, a viable you know potential business. So they were you know that was good to hear that they were much more uh, positive about considering half of it. Yeah, so uh, credit unions vary in, in the extent to which they handle business loans. Lost River Co-op and Paoli has their primary uh, financing through a local co-op, which is somewhat unusual, but uh, I think uh, something to look at. I do have a comment here that I want to share. It's not a question, but uh, one of the participants has suggested that if uh, any of you out there that are listening today have good suggestions about sources of uh, grant funding or other funding that's appropriate, particularly to urban environments, but perhaps to any, uh, that if you could share that, that would be very helpful. And, and I would suggest that you send those to me and I can post those later. So if you have any good. questions about how to reach me, uh, go to the, our website where my contact information is. Thank you, sir. So and I've one move us along. Uh, I'd like to move us along here, Ben. You had something you wanted to add? I was just going to mention that you list the uh, under member equity uh, average of 150. We're doing 200, and we were other people in the industry said shoot high for that, and it's been about the easiest sell of any of the other sources in terms of getting people comfortable with the idea of buying two memberships for $200, or buying equity shares for $200, and it adds up nicely, and it's really helpful to have that. So I guess I'm just putting that out there. Don't be afraid to ask for a very fair price for your shares. Yeah, you can. Uh when, when groups try to figure out how to set their member equity requirements, they too often think in terms of what can we get away with in terms of asking people, and they underestimate that. But when you really look at what the capital needs are and how many members you might have at maturity and how much capital you need to raise over time, uh, you know, I would certainly echo that number, you know, to it be in the 200 to $300 range. Yeah. Um, I want to... Uh, move us along here a little bit and uh, before we go in and look at the, the, the different sub stages here I want to just do a, uh, a brief look at uh, a financial reforma that uh, it, it has been set up and this is a, a ideal situation or a, not an ideal but a generic situation for an existing food co-op so it is showing the retail square feet 10,000, uh, total square feet 12,000, and sales increases over their prior year and then in years two through five. Some of the key assumptions here, and uh, uh, go, up, go back up here. Um, so, you know, lease rates, sales per square foot. Uh, opening dates, and then again a listing of the, the, the and the and this particular project is about a, a, almost a three million dollar project. But then once this, and then and then in the performa we have a, a, below that we have the scenario planning section where you can go in make changes to some of the key assumptions and then go through the whole the. Then there is a tab for financial statements uh, that uh, it's with the you know with the balance sheet and also in the case of being co-op shows its history and then transitioning to a sources and uses project and then day one and then going out in this case first five years showing the balance sheet. And one of the things we will look at as an indicator of financial feasibility will be the cash line. Maybe for a store of this size, we'll accept that there needs to be minimal cash at least of $200,000 or $150,000. Whatever that number is set at, this can tell us here we're getting, you know, we're either just a little over that or a little under that uh, at the end of year one and year two. So, a little bit marginal in terms of the 
financial feasibility. And then the, I like to look at three determinants of financial feasibility in a financial performa. And I'm going through this very quickly, but I just want to show you how to illustrate how the financial performa relates to the sources and uses budget. Uh, so the, the cash line being one of the determinants of financial feasibility, drop down, we start with an income statement showing what projected sales are for years one through five, taking away all the expenses, and what is the profitability, we see large loss in year one, year two, and then beginning to make money. Uh, I would ideally like to see year three be, in this case, 1% uh, profit, working up to 2% profit by year five. It will be a little different for a startup. It will probably take a little bit longer, but that's one of the indicators of financial feasibility. And then thirdly, we would look at some of the key ratios, debt to equity ratio and the current ratio being primary there. And so setting some standards and benchmarks of what those numbers need to be in order to have a financially feasible uh, startup project. So, and we also have a show that shows the detail of all the debt in terms of the payments and the interest rates. And uh, that's primarily what a, a financial performa might look like. So we, that was really not to be part of this webinar, but I just wanted to give you a glimpse of that. No, uh, uh, there's a question I'd like to interject here because I think it's kind of important since we are just looking at the pro forma briefly. Is, is it possible for participants to see a copy, and if not, or what, even if it is, how would they go about getting such a sophisticated pro forma created for them? Well, uh, it's a service we provide, and, and we really don't um, don't have a you know a, a version to show you, uh, we, you know, but we, we can walk through what's involved with that, but we provide that service and we will work with a, a group and create a financial performa. We, you know, the, the cost, that we, what we've been projecting as a cost for that, or quoting as a cost for that for a number of years here now is not to, not to exceed $3,500 for work to at least two drafts of a financial performa. And most often, if uh, we work through a number more drafts than that, uh, so we, we kind of bill at our hourly rate not to exceed that, that, that quote, that not to exceed amount. Uh, so we would be glad to discuss this with you on an individual basis. And any work you do to create any person use of the budget, for example, that would be part of that uh, that fits within that project of creating a financial performer. But you might do it, you might take it as a two-step process rather than doing it all at once. So that's, I think, the, the answer I can offer at this time. I want to go back to um, deep down. We have uh, about 15 minutes here, so I'm going to very quickly go through this worksheet that that is that is available on the you know, Food Club 500 website and it has been updated uh, here. Um, I thought I need to. It was actually updated here recently. I forgot to change that date up there. But the um, this shows that in stage one, for example, the organizing stage, that the uses budget might involve. $2,000 for project management, $2,000 for miscellaneous consulting, maybe $1,000 for some board training, corporation fees, hiring expense, miscellaneous, miscellaneous opening and admin, startup promotion. So this is, let's say, $13,250. <clears throat> and the sources that are going to be raised in stage one might be some cash from benefits and donations, 
maybe a small grant and maybe member equity from you know, 300 members at $150 each. Then we can look down here and say total horses, 60000 minus the uses as a positive cash flow for this period of 40, almost $47,000. In this period, there was 40 to 45,000 of member equity accumulated, and due to the fact that you raised $13,000, you didn't need to use any of the member equity through the organizing stage. So this begins to illustrate when the member equity is used in a project and when the member loan money is used in a project. At what stage of the organizing of the of the three-stage process? And at what decision point do you begin using the member equity money? I think you should think of member equity money being used to fund your organizing, your 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 work through the three stages. In this case, you, we see that in stage one, you're able to hold the member equity money and not use it. So at least you got to the end of stage one and said, okay, we're, do we want to go further? Do we have some preliminary feasibility and level of interest in our community that tells us we want to go into stage 2A? And if so, let's then go forward. We might need to use some of that member equity money. So let's see what we have here in stage 2A expenses. Uh, again, this would be a three to six month period of time. Uh, a little bit more investment into project management and consulting, having perhaps a market analysis, a financial performance, preliminary design work, further governance training, miscellaneous. Oops, we've got too much in here. We need to reduce our, our fees to meet our budget somehow, so we have to take 3000 out somewhere here. Uh, opening an admin prior to operating an admin participating. So we have total uses in stage 2A of 27,000. Where does the, what sources come in during stage 2A? The cash coming in from benefits and donations, not as much as stage 1, uh, but it, the grants pick up a little bit and the uh, member equity uh, continues to come in. So we have 40,000 of sources, 27,000 of uses, again a positive cash flow for stage 2A of $13,000 and added to the beginning cash gives almost $60,000 ending cash at the end of stage 2A where then you've been able to assess your Feasibility, working, looking at feasibility from a market point of view, from a internal readiness point of view. Is your organization coming together? Are you beginning to get the community support for it? Um, and from a financial feasibility point of view, and even from a preliminary design point of view, and say yes, this looks feasible. We're going to go ahead in stage 2B and do some more serious planning work, and we're going to more money in project management, consulting, uh, preliminary design work, more in the financial forma, etc. Uh, legal fees come into play, uh, hiring expense. Oops, we're a little over budget here. We need to cut back 3000 somewhere. Um, and then we have totally almost $30,000 in stage 2B. And we've raised another forty thousand dollars, so cash flow for the period is positive ten thousand. We're up to seventy thousand for cash. Um, you know, we have begun using some member equity. Um, so the member equity continues. To we begin to use some member equity here in stage two A. Stage 2B, but a very small percentage of it. The end of stage 2B, 
the idea is you secure a site contingent upon getting all your financing in place. And then you go into stage 3A, and your final decision point is at the end of stage 3A. So we can see that um, you know we can see that we're going to use some member equity, uh, and we have um, you know, member loans that uh, are beginning to be used in the industry. So this this begins to show you know. How of the sorts of these like unfold during the project, and it's a, a worksheet that that requires you know, some study and some work to it. And uh, Ben, I'd just like to check in with you a little bit to see if your group has been able to use a similar approach to budgeting for stage and how that's gone for you. Uh, we've not been as good at this as we probably should. Um, we're, uh, yeah, we just haven't been quite as good at it. Um, we've been using annual budgets and then trying to break it down monthly and uh, then look at that in terms of our progress towards the different stages. But we haven't actually created it. We haven't used this template. I think you made this template after we already were in in the midst of our budgeting process. Um, certainly, I think it's a nice, you know, I'd like to use it or maybe adapt. Uh, at this point, we're well into, you know, towards the end of stage, the stage two uh, areas, but it would still be handy to use it. I'm just not sure if we're going to get around to plugging all of our numbers into it at this point. Yeah. Yeah. But it is, it is a way to illustrate how the of course, the usage budget is just not a, a static, you know, document. You need to look at it as how does the cash come in to the organization and how does it go out. And uh, so this, whether you use this specific format or not, this hopefully can, can help help you gain awareness of that whole process. Yeah. So with that, Stuart, I'm going to come back to you and see if you have Questions. Yeah, um, I think uh, a couple here still. Um, one of them is, uh, and I'm going to combine a couple of questions and try to summarize, but when you find yourself off budget in terms of those uh, sources and uses as you're going through development, how important is it to make adjustments for that? What do you, I mean, how are there specific aspects of that sources and uses budget that are most critical that you stay on target? Uh, can you use it in that way even as a tool for examining the effectiveness of your organizing effort? Yeah, I think it is important to monitor as you're going along and to, to compare your, um, or your actual with your budget. Um, there is a, you know, Format where you can uh, show uh, the, the, the format that shows, for example, uh, how project funds have been used to date, you know, and how much, what was the original budget, and how much is, is remaining from that budget. And similarly with the sources, uh, you can begin to show how. Uh, Member loans are coming in and bought that, have a budget for your project over time. Um, and and as you compare actual to budget, and you begin to see variance, then you need to to respond to that. It's not like if your budget is rigid and it's never going to change, but when you just do it, you do it in a thoughtful way that, that commits you to that document and there's a sense of accountability that begins to be built through the organization. Would this uh, template that we have in front of us right now, would that be appropriate uh, as an annual budget report to the membership for an annual meeting? Uh, I think it's too detailed uh, for the membership. 
and so I wouldn't uh, attempt to try to try to use it in this complete form. Uh, you know, you could. I mean, it has too much detail in the notes, for example. But and you might want to, for example, some of the uses here, uh, collapse some of those. And these are basically soft costs. Uh, you know, you can perhaps you give some detail on that, but perhaps not. But you know, the basic. It's most important that the board and the core group be have an awareness of and be educated about the sources and uses of budget. And then selectively beyond that, you will, you will begin to educate your members, but not in the level of detail that is shown here. Um, what about uh, using a condensed version of the same uh, pro forma that, that show, or not the pro forma, but the uh, sources and uses budget that shows the stages? Uh, if you were to be able to condense that to show people how you were moving through the project and how it evolved, yeah, I think educating uh, your members on the on the stages and showing what are the costs and what are the sources of funds during each stage uh, in a in a condensed version. Of the you know, I, I I get overwhelmed looking at this one here. You, so oh, you you can't try to present all this. I just have a couple other uh, comments right now that are, are still unanswered. One is uh, from one of our participants that they are currently using three separate versions of a sources and uses budget based on three different locations that they're considering. And I think, what do you think of that uh, approach? I think that that can be good, but again, the, it, it can be a useful guide and a way to give a, get a picture of each location, and, and you can do some comparison. But it doesn't, again, the source of the uses budget doesn't tell you what, which project is financially viable or most financially feasible. Um, the source of the uses budget by itself doesn't tell that. So, uh, you know, you can eventually create performance and you can create performance for all three different locations if you, if you wanted to. Yeah, I'd like to have you just talk to that just a, a, a little bit. The, the relationship between the sources and uses and the pro forma, that they, they don't stand alone. Either one of them, right? No, no the sources and uses budget, I mean, I, I think of it as a cover page of the financial performance. It's the, it's the picture of the project, uh, but then the financial performance shows how is this scenario that we're, we've sketched out in the source of the uses budget, how is that projected to perform over time? And how do, um, you know, how can you look and assess, can you, is there adequate cash flow and can you service the debt? And those are the key questions to help your, your, your board and your members feel comfortable with the risk level that is being taken. At this point, we only use our sources and uses as part of the pro forma because we have the pro forma now. Uh, so when you know we have a good copy that we keep saved in one place, and then we have working versions that we save in a different folder. So if we know of an actual cost or a cost change, we can plug it in and not only see how it affects sources and uses, but then look at how it affects the rest of the financial projections in the pro forma. So we're we're nearing the end of our time here in this final minute. I just come back to the five learning goals for this webinar. And hopefully we've made some progress on on each of these rather ambitious goals. But uh, I, I want to thank uh, ben, uh, ben from the Friendly City Food Co-op in Harrisonburg, Virginia. You can Google their co-op. It has one of the nicest names of a co-op that I know, Friendly City Food Co-op and uh, certainly reach Ben through that uh, website. Um, thank you, Ben, for being with us. Your experience hearing directly from you really adds a lot. Please note that your conference will expire in 10 minutes. And thank you, uh, Stuart, and Mark, and Marilyn. And uh, thank you for everybody who's been part of this. Well, and thank uh, you, Bill. That was very informative and really appreciate your assistance here today. Good job, Bill. And I'm going to flash on to the...
I might have been to you know, uh, maybe they won't. <laughs> uh, keep it on our learning goals. But um, contact information is in the in the slides, and they can be accessed through the Blue Club 500 website. Right. And, and I would also like to say thanks to Bill for a great webinar and. For those of you who may have questions later, don't hesitate to send them to me, and I will pass them on if I can't answer them. But we, we look forward to being able to help you in that way. And I welcome hearing from any of you. So appreciate appreciate the work you all are doing. Thank you.